Hi, every, hi everybody, we're back. This is Dave Vellante with Stu Miniman. And this is our spotlight on service providers. It's a, it's a critical segment of the market that <clears throat> Wikibon and SiliconANGLE have covered for quite some time. And we, we have been on this, uh, this trend. I mean, we've certainly been tracking the whole cloud service provision market for a number of years now. It's a critical uh, value add for clients. It's a distribution channel. It's a technology innovator. One of the things we we said when we first brought theCUBE to VMworld 2010 is we noted that most IT shops, and virtually all IT shops you talk to, their budgets really aren't growing unless the company is growing like crazy, and even then, you know, budgets are, are under a lot of pressure. It's different at cloud service providers. Cloud service providers monetize IT, they're growing like crazy, they're investing, they're innovating, and it's very difficult, you know, in our view over time, for IT to kind of close that innovation gap, and the way they close that gap really is, as we've talked about a number of times, they become cloud brokers, they, tap the best services that they can find for the right use case. And that's really what we're sort of unpacking today and we're taking some examples uh, from, of, of partners of, of VMware, the EMC's uh, Velocity Service Provider Program. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a growing and, and, and increasingly rich set of partners and one of them is Secure24. Sean Donaldson is here. He's the Chief Architect of Secure24, Cloud Service Provider. Sean, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you. So kind of a long-winded intro here to let you collect your thoughts about uh, what you're going to say in the cube. But, <laughs> um, tell me, where are we with regard to the state of the cloud service provider? Um, and you, again, you heard my intro. Um, there seems to be significant uptake in your market space. Uh, tell us about your company and how you're participating in that trend. Yeah, absolutely. Specifically in a, a cloud hosting, cloud hosting can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? It's a very ambiguous term all the way from Amazon where you're um, deploying systems yourself but you have no SLA, let's say, right? What we do is we fit a pretty, uh, pretty unique niche in that market where we focus on uh, high compliancy, tier one applications in a, what we like to refer to as an enterprise private cloud. So our, our cloud hosting is really focused around what are the applications that are most critical for your business that you have challenges with today from, from both a maintaining top end resources to compliancy and auditing, um, and you want to outsource, but you want to actually have that reassurance that they're still being secured, they still have tight SLAs around them and uh, um, availability and compliancy, right? Okay, so, so you said, you called it no SLA, and the no SLA, there's an SLA in Amazon, I can pull it off the web. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but you're calling it no SLA, and that's because you're, I'm inferring from your statement, that you, you offer a much more rigorous SLA. Um, talk about that a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. So like, just like a, um, uh, within a traditional hosting environment, your, your tier one applications are going to be your most critical applications for your business, right? So SLAs are measured, obviously, with the utmost availability. So we look at um, hosting our infrastructure more from even an infrastructure SLA to an application availability SLA. So if, if the systems we run, the systems we host go down, it's not somehow that it's an inconvenience for the business, it's somehow that shipping stops on the west coast or global manufacturing stops for an organization. Okay, so so turn that or, or, or take that through to the SLA that, that you offer. So I mean, we all I mean, I've read Amazon's SLAs. Yeah. I've, I've gone through and, and, and I mean, essentially, it's a it's a it's, it's a shared risk model. Let me just put it that way. Yep. Okay, they're putting a lot of risk on the customer, um, and the penalties are, are relatively minimal. Um, how is yours different? So our SLA, so our, our SLA obviously varies on a client by client basis based on the architecture and design that you pick, right? So we partner obviously very closely with uh, EMC, VMware. So based on a lot of technologies we offer, we can offer everything from a uh, zero um, RPO RTO to you know three or four nines depending on what your version. It's all about the, the infrastructure that's designed for the particular client, and we have skin in the game, right? So there is financial penalties for us if those, if we don't meet those SLAs. Okay, uh, um, so I gotta, I gotta keep asking. So there's financial penalties for Amazon too, they're just minimal. Yep. Um, now, you can argue that it's a reasonable way for them to approach the business because they're massive scale, 200,000 customers. Um, when you say financial penalties, so, you know, give me a rough example. Uh, I mean, is there pain for you if, if the customer goes down? And, and how much pain? You know, low, medium, high. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a significant amount of pain for us if the customer goes down. So um, that's, I would say, very high in, in that regard, right? Okay. And it, keep in mind, customers are trusting us with, again, like I said, their, their most critical uh, applications. So SAP, right? Oracle, eBusiness, Hyperion. 
the financials that run their run their companies. So there's a there's a high a high penalty there, and also you got to look at it from the perspective of compliancy, right? So most compliancy, depending on if it's PCI, if it's SOX, if it's ITAR, there's there's penalties that are tied to those as well. Sean, I'm wondering if you can talk to kind of customer adoption. You know, obviously EMC has a long tradition of running you know mission critical applications, but even moving to virtual virtualized mission critical applications, it took us years to get there. Um, you know, I, I think back to you know five ten years ago. You know, uh, just like Amazon is mostly test dev, that you know that's where VMware started. Um, you know, how do you get that that customer to not only you know say okay, I'm going to be virtualized, but you know I'm, I'm now going to you know use some service provider for that. How how do how do they make that leap of faith and how, how do you bring them along that path? No, absolutely, and, and through, the, through the progression of VMware, right? So what we've seen is with, and it really started, for us it really started with vSphere 5, right? So vSphere 5 is really when we saw with um, a lot of the capabilities for increased memory, increased VMware size, that's where we saw the transition from VMware being a consolidation product to VMware being a availability product. So where we see um, a lot of adoption is being able to offer such things as SRM, where we can fail over between multiple data centers, uh, high availability across hardware, some of those, some of those uh, uh, features and, and concepts are what really allow us to host those tier one applications in a virtualized environment, and not only, not only do the consolidation, but also do increase availability and increase um, you know uptime for the client. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I guess when I, you know, look at what you know what's really needed in the service provider market, you know, networking is is one of the critical components. Uh, most of the time, service providers, um, you know, either you know have some you know mega networking uh, piece or they're they're close to their customer. You know, how do you you know get your? Is it a locality thing for most of your clients? How do you deal with that? Again, with with us really focusing on um, you know top tier applications, tier one applications in the cloud. We actually, just about all of our customers connect to into us with uh, MPLS, right? So Secure24 within our, within our multiple data centers runs our own private MPLS network, and we have our clients connect into our MPLS network um, uh, via their MPLS network, right? So it's kind of a bridging of the two MPLS networks, and we keep that layer three separation for each individual client all the way through the environment. Right now, we're very uh, focused on the Cisco stack, so we're uh, very much Cisco Nexus 1000V. We're very excited about the NX, NSX release, where we've had uh, quite a few meetings about that, and we're very interested to see where that's going and see how that can uh, can kind of change the shape of uh, virtual networking. Yeah, so uh, that uh, I wonder if you can comment then, if you're you know using Cisco, but you're looking at NSX, you know, there's a little bit of difference of opinion as to where the future of networking go. What, what's your what's your take? What's needed from your standpoint to be able to bring your network and you know entire solution? forward? You know, ultimately it comes down to, so a lot of people talk about um, um, software-defined networking, right? One of, the biggest, one of the biggest aspects we see with NSX that is, is kind of maybe a little bit undercut is software-defined security as well, right? So what is the, so one of the big advantages obviously is the capability of being able to um, more easily automate my, my network deployment, my complex network deployments across multiple data centers, but also to take that security farther into the uh, virtualization stack and be able to offer that security all the way up into the uh, hypervisor and the ESX layer. So, I wonder if we can come back to this whole notion that I was exploring a little earlier in this segment on, on competing as an ecosystem. Um, so, obviously you got the gorilla in the room, the public cloud is, is Amazon. You've got other large companies as well. You got you know, IBM and, and HP, huge mm -hmm. customer bases. You and others are, are partnering up with companies like VMware, like EMC, to compete on an ecosystem basis. What are the advantages and challenges of that approach that you see in the marketplace? Can you restate that? Yeah, so you're basically competing not head on, yeah. you know, with an Amazon or even an HP or an mm -hmm. IBM. You're competing as, as partners. Yeah. Uh, you're competing you know, together as a uh, what I would call an ecosystem. So yeah. a group of partners that bring different skill sets to the table that mm -hmm. allow you to, you to offer a, a, you know, as much as a single company as a group. Um, but so there are challenges to doing that. You know, you've got to work together, you're different companies, yeah. you've got different billing systems, you've got different go to market, you've got different strategies. So there's incompatibility. So there's, at the same time there's advantages mm -hmm. because you can tap resources that you don't necessarily have in terms. So I wanted you to, Talk about that a little bit. What are some of the pluses and the and the drawbacks that you find, and how are you managing those? Yeah, so you know, um, a lot of our a lot of our stack currently is a Cisco 
EMC, VMware, right? And they've been very successful with us as far as growing uh, very flexible. So a few of the things that really differentiate ourselves, obviously there's the security and the compliancy, but we, we very much look at ourselves as a customer service organization as well. And one of the biggest things that helps differentiate ourselves from maybe some of the other providers is that customer service, as well as the compliancy and the other aspects there, but the customer service focus and the nimbleness, the, go to mar the time to market, right? A lot of our clients want that, you know, from a, from a cloud provider, it's got to be both, both uh, a balance between two worlds, right? It's got to be the balance between rapid deployment and the balance between control and compliancy. Okay, so I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. Um, I want to talk about security again. So that you're, 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 it's an area you know very well, and much better than I. Um, so, Amazon says security is our number one priority. Mm -hmm. Our security is better than most of our customers. Um, uh, you know, in a in a in a in a, in a, in a an on-premise environment, um, we're innovating, and you know, it's a differentiator for us. And we'll take anybody on in security. Mm -hmm. So when you hear that as a security practitioner, yeah, and a company whose name you know in, implies security, what do you say to that? You know, I say it's, um, I definitely appreciate their their uh, their drive toward it, and I definitely think security is going to be a lot of the future. I think everybody sees that. I think mm -hmm. I think a lot of evidence of the importance of security is what Amazon's doing, right? So so showing the, uh, Amazon is, is intrinsically showing the importance of why security is important for a cloud infrastructure, and uh, obviously taking their path to do that. Well, Secure24, we're taking the path of partnering with you know, VMware, Cisco, and trying to, and also continuing to stay you know, cutting edge on the security side, and what we do, what we offer sometimes that's uh, a little more transparency into how we're doing it, right? So we can, we can bring our clients with our partners and show them the security technologies, security infrastructure, and security methodologies that we're using. So, okay, so I want to follow up on that. I pick on Amazon because they're the, they're the largest player. Everybody compares to, you know, to yeah. Amazon. And you, I'm sure you get a lot of questions from customers about Amazon. Absolutely. So, transparency. So Amazon would say to that, well, you can go in and you can get a console and you can see virtually how everything's configured mm -hmm. uh, and the like. We're very transparent mm -hmm. on our security. Um, now, I know how I would respond to that if I were you, but I'm, I, want, I don't want to put words in your mouth. <laughs> what do you say to that? Well, I mean, I think they use a lot of proprietary code, right? It's a lot of proprietary code they they run, and I don't think their transparency is quite as as uh, as clear as a lot of these large enterprises require. So, a lot of large enterprises they require auditing from um, they're continuously being audited, and that, that's kind of where the compliance side comes in. So, when you have whether it's PCI or SOX or HIPAA or ITAR, where you have regulations that say, for example, only U.S. citizens can access even the physical infrastructure for it, right? You need, you need maybe a little bit of additional degrees of isolation and um, uh, separation in the environment that you could ever get from an Amazon type company. Okay, and you're, so your argument is you provide that. The other thing I would say is that Amazon won't let you come in and, and audit you know, the physical site. Will, will you do that? Absolutely, absolutely. So that's, that's also a good example. So breaking down to what um, I got a lot of them, we could talk offline if you want. No, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. It's, it's always great to hear, right? So, and, uh, but it's all about you know, breaking down the physical stack, or the application stack, and that's what we can even do with our clients and with the auditors. We can take it all the way from application security to the OS security to the virtualization layer security, and looking at things like VMware, for example, there's, there's very specific industry standard hardening guides for VMware, right? So giving that transparency to an industry standard hardening guide, auditors can accept that very well. Then getting into the data center space, right? There's very accepted industry standards for data center hardening, data center tiers, what's within it. And to your point, right, being able to actually, here's the site, take it from all the way from a site audit all the way up through the application. John, what's your strategy with regard to um, al alternative hypervisors or platforms, whether it's Hyper-V or, or OpenStack? Are you sort of riding the, the, the VMware wave in, in, in that regard? Or do you have other more deliberate, you know, sort of uh, paths and vectors there. No, absolutely. So VMware is pretty much our, our primary go-to market. We do have a number of other uh, hypervisors we run, well, but for very specific use cases, right? Um, so Oracle VM, for example, uh, Oracle is very specific about their licensing and, and uh, Red Stack, right? So that's another uh, option for, but it's all about a very specific use case. And it's not about, um, um, locking ourselves into one technology. We obviously have a primary go-to-market and we've had a lot of success with VMware and we've had, and we found it to, to really be one of the more mature hypervisors on the market. But we also are always trying to also stay open-minded and look at 
look at all the other. I mean, it's uh, the best for the mission critical applications, wouldn't you say? I mean, is there? No, I completely agree with no that. No question, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. the practitionators. You know, Oracle might disagree, right? That. But yeah. yeah. Um, I guess in public, Oracle would disagree, yeah, yeah. but I mean, OVM and, and I mean, OVM's definitely showing up more in our in our surveys, right, Stu? But, yeah. but I mean, I think the, you know, the, the customers speak for themselves, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, so Sean, talking about your environment, you have heterogeneous pieces. Mm -hmm. If I look at the typical enterprise versus the big cloud guys or even the service providers, it's usually around how you scale, how you can grow really fast, and how you can manage your environment, so, uh, you know, you know the the, the the hyperscale guys. You know, talk about how they can manage. You know, ten thousand servers and just move in racks and new data centers. You know, easily. And you know, the PUEs that are you know ridiculously low. Yep. You know, can you tell us a little bit about you know your environment and how you you know simplify your management? You know, what, what's the size of your IT team and uh, you know how much uh, you know breadth are you covering and how fast are you growing? Yeah, absolutely. So we're we're growing at a uh, tremendous rate. I'm trying to think of some numbers I could very very specifically give you. It's always hard, right? But um, what we've kind of designed is we've kind of designed ourselves into, and a lot of people take their own different approaches. To this we call it the Secure 24 Universe, right? So, which we thought was a, an interesting uh, place since they said Masters of the Universe in the opening, right? So it actually worked out very well for us. But. Um, and our data center is a very modular data center in that approach where we can grow compute and um, compute resources at a very easy, modular, consistent rate. So growing, a, and we have a number of data centers, but for our model, growing a data center from let's say 1,000 virtual machines to 10,000 to 50,000 is a consistent reproducible process. We don't run into the at a certain point, the bubble bursts and um, you have big challenges, right? So. A lot of times enterprises run into that situation where there's, whether it's the network infrastructure, the storage infrastructure, it runs into this case where the environment works very good, but at a particular point in scale, the complexity increases exponentially, right? So the, the model we put in place is very automation focused, right? Um, these, we're uh, using VCO for that. And it's that idea of linear scalability without exponential complexity, right? Okay, so that's the compute. How about the, the rest of your stack? Specifically um, storage. Oh, storage. Well, storage is obviously a, a, a challenge for a lot of people right now, and VVOLs are very exciting to be coming out in vSphere 6. So I think we're all pretty pretty excited about what's going to happen with uh, with that. So we use uh, uh, VMAX, and we've actually we've actually kind of scaled VMAX in a lot of the similar ways, right? So um, we're a big uh, proponent of the VMAX 10Ks, and we scale those out um, in equal size chunks and grow those out kind of in the same linear fashion. So we've decoupled our enterprise compute from our enterprise storage and they both grow in their own kind of linear fashion. Okay. All right, Sean, well listen, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE, sharing your perspectives and uh, we wish you the best of luck and uh, love to trade ideas and notes with you as this thing changes. It's an ever moving target, isn't it? And, uh, Absolutely. You're never done, as they say. All right, Stu, and thank you. Keep it right there, buddy. We'll be back up. Stu, uh, we'll be right back. Stu and I will be back to wrap up VMworld 2013 Day 3. Right back after this. <laughs>